Welcome back for another episode of Christian Conspiracy Coalition, a place where the best minds in the conspiracy realm gather together to share and discuss their faith, Christianity, and the spiritual war thrust upon humanity. Free will has been a topic that's challenged many Christians. The view can differ between denominations and it's easy to become confused on the matter, especially when living in a world filled with philosophical works and scientific exploits. Humanity has grappled with the idea of fate and predestination for thousands of years, and now the ideas of string theory and the multiverse are thrown into the mix, which make it a very daunting topic. Yet this continually becomes a topic between those of the faith and secular people alike. Martin Luther is known for having to say this on the topic. The forces of good and evil are working within and around me. I must choose, and in a free will universe, I do have a choice. On the panel today, to help me discuss this topic of free will, men, angels, and God, I am joined by Brandon Kroll of the Manny Daily Podcast. Welcome, Brandon. Hey, Drew. Thanks for having me back on. Good to have you back, brother. And it has been a long time between drinks, my friends. We have back on the show Christopher and Jason from Operation Red Pill. Welcome back, gentlemen. What's going down, Drew? It's good to be here, man. You guys are putting out a whole heap of content lately, my friends, and it is absolute fire. Well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Christopher drives a hard ship. Let me tell you, <laughs> you know, I would, I would much rather sit back and play Xbox and chill. You know, the latest Call of Duty came out. I was like, mm, Bloodlines, the Illuminati, Call of Duty. This is a hard choice, Lord. I'm really thinking I got to get this kill streak up. I mean, you know, we can wait here. Brick Springwire can wait on, you know, having to get up with these, you know, Bloodlines episodes. I need to get the kill streaks up. But no, nah, man, it's, it's been pretty dope. Why not both? <laughs> I don't have time for both. I like where your mind is at, Brandon. I do. I would really Brandon like to make a strong effort for that. <laughs> right. I'm oh, just I'm funny. just a little bit concerned that Christopher's running a hard ship with a brother because it's I hope it's not called the Armistad 2 because there's oh. a lot of historical <laughs> issues there. <laughs> I was wondering who was gonna pick up on that little nuance. I'm glad you did. If you see me blink <laughs> twice, come rescue me. <laughs> Right, this is how they get you nowadays. Oh, we can be friends. Come on. Next thing you know, you're doing all the work. <laughs> oh, boys, boys, boys. Far too long, and you're back with the fire, bringing the energy already. I love it. Now, Brandon, you actually mentioned uh, this or suggested this topic rather in one of our group chats that for a little while now, you've been getting questions from some of your listeners in regards to free will, just in, in general. Yeah. And did God make a mistake giving humanity free will? So let's just see where th this is going to go to. And where would you like to start with this? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I like summing it up this way, is that God allows the decision. Satan provides the temptation. We determine the outcome. And I think this is something that a lot of folks don't seem to be grasping is that <laughs> That's pretty significant because a lot of people are saying, well, you know, if God's all loving, if God, nah, nah, nah. and it's like, well, first you say, if God's all loving, how come he doesn't destroy the evil in the world? Well, he did at least a good extent with the flood. And then you flip around and say, well, if he's a loving God, why would he kill a whole bunch of people? It's like, well, it wasn't necessarily the people, but they were tainted because they kept going in the direction that they wanted to. And I think this is something that folks don't seem to realize is that in order to say free will is a mistake, you're basically saying that, God, I just want to be a robot, which coincidentally, that's kind of what they're pushing for a new world order at the Empire of Iron and Clay, is I want to consent to the system of government, which means a mind control. And that's Oxford Dictionary. When you look up the word mental, it can expect to mind with the Latin. So yes, government means mind control. So if you're consenting to the government... <laughs> And you just want to become another autonomous sim character. You just want them to fix your problems, provide your monetary needs, not question the system, or as we were talking prior to the show, do it or else I'm going to fine you for not consenting to my system. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think this is what folks don't seem to realize is that spiritually, that's huge. And because I don't think we talk about that too much within the church community, a lot of us don't know how to answer that question because we're over here going, well, yeah, free will, so whatever. But it's like, this is literally what got the whole shebang going with sin. Now, I was talking with my neighbor. Um, I'll close with this, then I'll pass back to the room. And she was pitching, whether it's true or not, it was just something that made me start thinking. That God gave Adam Eve. And she had, you know, it was supposed to be on Adam's 
behalf. If you want to stick with God, you have to either eliminate the threat that is tempting her or take out Eve. And God would provide something back up. Why? Because she has conf she has decided not to walk with God and she decided to take the serpent's word, which we know in the occult, you need some kind of like spell, kind of like Snow White, you have to bite into the apple. You have to have consent to the word. She took the serpent's word and then bit into something. Again, whether that was sexual, whether it's not, but this is the start of the serpent seed, I would imagine. Because what do we get with Christ? John 1, 14, the word became flesh. And then John, uh, Revelation 19, 13, and the name of Christ is the word of God. So in, in essence, in order to get to God the Father, you have to submit to Christ the Son, which is the Word. A lot of Christians aren't submitting to the Word or obe obeying like they're supposed to. Instead, they're twisting around Scripture saying, well, God knows my heart. I'm just going to twist that and, you know, I'm not going to submit to what is literally laid out right here. This is what we constantly do as Christians. We try to create God in our own image as opposed to submitting to his Word. So a lot of people... Maybe it was Cain. This is how we get the serpent seed or the influence of why we are inherently natured with sin. Because half of us has Eve because she consummated something here to know good and evil. And the other one walked with God. So now any and descendant after that, you were literally mixed right down the middle. But in order to come back to God, you have to submit to the father's son or you are antichrist. And antichrist means substitute. So I know that's a huge thing to open up with, but that's kind of what's making me think. I was like, I think we need to talk about that because if we don't, do we really understand what it is to submit to Christ and follow him and pick up your cross? I don't no, know. I, I like that. What were you going to say, Drew? I'm, sorry, I'm, just, I'm glad you actually brought this topic to the panel because I don't besmirch anyone for questioning the idea of free will and what it means. And the very logical common sense approach for say a non-secular or a normie person is that, you know, why wouldn't an all powerful omnipotent God create beings that could rebel against him or that could do the wrong thing? Why wouldn't you just make them follow the rules? That's a really logical common sense approach that I think lots of people, uh, even within the faith end up having a part of their worldview because of the system that we're brought up in. You know, we're, we're, we're told from a very young age, you follow the rules we have a set of laws, we go to school, these are the expectations. All these things build our worldview and impact our understanding of what free will means. And then it can bring about these questions of doubt of, you know, why would God create humans with free will when we when he could have just created us to do the right thing? So it's a poignant conversation. I'm, I'm thankful that you actually brought it up. Uh, I, I think that these type of conversations are ones that I really like because they really help to exemplify this idea of considering where we're at in a, in a topic, in a conversation. Like I was telling somebody, let me start, start backwards for a moment. I was telling somebody recently, they were like, your favorite movie is Top Gun. I was like, yes, I love it. Absolutely love the movie. But there's a scene in Top Gun that I did not, realize how the scene had impacted me throughout my life it's one in which tom cruise's character maverick is talking to his mentor viper and viper's telling him that as a pilot a good pilot's compelled to always evaluate what's happened so you can apply what you've learned because up there in the air we've really got to push it and i was like yo that's actually a really interesting concept because it's applicable not just within the world of aviation it's applicable across the board, especially within the realm of Christianity. We have to always evaluate what's happened so we can apply what we've learned in the environment in which we serve. One of the misnomers is we tend to come into an environment or situation and think that now that we've arrived on the scene, this is where things start. Right. And if you deal with anybody that's in the military or paramilitary organization or anyone that deals with working in a, in a dynamic environment, they teach you the importance of situational awareness. Being able to come around, recognize what's happening, also realize that something has transpired prior to you arriving on the scene. You need to get all that information together in order to arrive at a specific end goal. This happens within creation right we we are literally put into a pre-existing story as humanity and this is important because a lot of the things we discuss 
they are the byproducts of a pre-existing condition because we were put into a story. We're not the beginning part of that story. So if we hold that true, when it comes to different concepts that we start evaluating, we have to decide first off, as soon as we jump into it, is this just now being an issue or is this part of an ongoing story that I'm walking into, such as the concept of free will? I think it's part of an ongoing story that requires us to slow down and back up. Why? Because it's built on other ideas that we actually hold to be self-evident true before we start to discuss and dismantle any of it. Things like our language, things like psychology, things like philosophy, these become really important, um, I don't want to say they become really important conversational pegs to slow down and consider because they really direct the flow of the conversation. So if we're talking about something like will, where do we get this concept from? Yes, it's biblical, but then we have ideas like free will. Most of that type of stuff we're talking about are, are it's the, it's the result of uh, psychological discussions and philosophical discussions. So if we're looking at people who have helped to mold our idea of psychology obviously we're going to be talking about crack brains like sigmund freud nothing to see here we know he had a little bit of the angel dust you know a little sugar <laughs> booger it probably didn't influence his conclusions at all which means it probably hasn't influenced us much at all right you got people like carl young also not starting from a biblical perspective if we start delving into the world of philosophy we've got a lot of the what we got plato socrates aristotle we know these guys are not, again, starting from a biblical perspective, but they are framing the conversation for us from the get-go. This is important because like, if, if we talk about philosophy, philosophy just as an idea comes from phileo, which would be one of the, I think it's five types of love in the Greek language, and then Sophia, Sophia being the goddess of knowledge. But what kind of knowledge is very important? Right. Philosophy is the love of the goddess who provides pagan knowledge. That's really where what it boils down to. So if we're getting ideas framed for us from people who start from a pagan perspective, we then have to slow down to ask, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is what you're saying even valid, right? We got to start dealing with ideas like axioms and premises. And I know people are like axioms. We're not even talking about mechanics and automotive stuff here. What are you talking about? My axles is fine. <laughs> no, an axiom is actually an accepted truth within a statement or a proposition. So it's one of those things that we just accept as true. We don't challenge it. You can have something that's axiologically flawed. The thing that we've accepted as true may not actually be true just within the, the the question. And then if we're putting a question forth, questions are built on premises. And a premise is really a previous statement or proposition from which another is inferred or follows as a conclusion. What that basically means is in the realm of logic, a conclusion is only valid if the premise that it's built upon is valid. So now there's a lot of slowing down that has to happen here when the question is put forth, is there such thing as free will? Because I got to ask the question, where did we get free will from? The concept. I don't see the phrasing anywhere in scripture. What I do see is I see the term will and I see choice. So it makes me ask the question, have we been subtly deceived into thinking that there's a concept such as free will? By way by which then we can challenge the character of God to say, did he make a mistake in giving it to us? See, there's a flaw right there. Now, technically, if Christopher and I were having this conversation, we'd be like, hey, we reject the premise of the question to begin with. If God <laughs> made a mistake with free will, it implies that God can make mistakes. I can't accept that fact to begin with. So therefore, I can't even really accept the question. Did he make a mistake in giving man free will? But let's put that off to the side for a second. Let's deal with the fact that when it comes to linguistics and when it comes to these types of questions, why am I forcing the slowdown? I'm forcing the slowdown because of something that I would call cultural linguistics, which is where if you have error that is built into an idea, into your language, into your phrasing, into your question, which then affects your, your thinking. 
it's possible to build that error and to allow it to go unchecked for so long, it can produce slate enslavement. And here's what I mean. If you have error, error can lead to deception. Deception can lead to bondage. Bondage leads to enslavement. Enslavement leads to death. There was a lady who said once that it takes four generations for an error to be left unchecked before it becomes accepted truth. And the way it becomes accepted truth is it becomes culture. It's just the way that we think. So here in the West, we banter around the idea of freedom a lot, right? But we have a very, very marred view of freedom. Like we literally say in the United States, we're the land of the free, right? It's part of our national identity. Coincidentally, we imprison a higher population per capita of our citizens than any other country, than almost any other country in the developed world. That does not sound free to me. But we think we're free. We actually live in a land of bondage. We know we do. So our idea of freedom is marred. We can't even come into the discussion free of any of these outside influences to talk about free will, which is a huge little issue, if you ask me. Because what does it show us? It shows us that there's no such thing as the American concept of freedom, which typically is derived as being not having any consequence for action. Like literally I can do whatever I want. That doesn't hold from a biblical perspective. We're either free from something or free to do something, but we're not in this ambiguous stage where I can just do whatever I want. Right? Like God tells us, I want to free you from the power of sin, right? The influence of sin. I'm freeing you from that. Okay, but now that I'm free from that, am I free to just do whatever? Nope. I am freeing you from the power and influence of sin so that you are free to pursue me and righteousness, right? So there's a relationship. That's not how we envision it within the Western concept of freedom. We envision freedom as complete liberty to do whatever. And that's not biblically accurate, right? Because now you got to start talking about your will. If I am, if I am free to do whatever I want, my will comes into play. And if I act on my will, my volition is coming into play. Well, does scripture have anything to say about that? It does. It has a lot to say with what we do with our will. Who's our biggest example of it? Jesus Christ. What did he do with his will? He submitted it. He submitted it to the father to the degree that scripture says he only did what the father told him to do. And he only said what the father told him to say. I can't imagine that. I can't really get down with that personally. I got a lot of stuff I want to say myself. I'm not really checking with God on everything that needs to be said. Some things you just going to have to hear directly from Spears. But Christ didn't follow that model, right? He didn't even speak from his own position. He spoke only what the Father said for him to speak and only did what the Father told him to do. What is that? That's an example of his will being submitted. We see this exemplified, not just in his life, but in the Garden of Gethsemane, what does he say? Not my will, but yours be done. So he submits it. On the counter perspective, we see will not being submitted where? By Lucifer, by the enemy and those who have joined his help. He operates under my will be done. It is like the number one axiom of, or mantra of Satanism, right? Do as thou wilt is the thing. So the concept then of free will is, I think, a deceptive idea because none of our wills are supposed to be free. They're supposed to be submitted. And even from the camp where it puts forth free will, that will is constantly being influenced by satanic ideologies. Therefore, even if you do what you want, you're not actually acting in a, in a free sense. You're acting in an influence sense, which is where we get the satanic control matrix because there's so much mind control that has gone on to influence your thinking so that you choose to do that, which you think is your choice, but is really what Satan wanted you to do all along. There's no such thing then. And from my perspective, as free will. Wow. You're back and you just hammered it. Hammered it home, brother. <laughs> Dude, this is why don't the, let me talk, you, man. You took the words right, right, right out of my mouth. It's when you think of the idea of free will, it comes back to the, the moniker that we see with the Freemasonry, do what thou willst, right? And mm -hmm. I think you mentioned earlier as well that 
humans and humanity, we're coming into the story halfway through. We're not even at the start of this. So how do we address something that's already been in creation and a part of God's timeline since the inception? And this is, I've got to cut, make this small connection. And there's a video that's doing the rounds at the moment from the horror film Nefarious in which our um, protagonist, the, the bad guy, the man who's uh, possessed by a demon, sits down and he poses a question to the interviewer that angels were given free will, my people were given free will by the creator, but we were forced to follow his will. And in that sense, we were enslaved, we were in bondage. And it's it's this big video that's doing the rounds right now. It's gaining a lot of traction because on a logical level and a level based on say philosophy and psychology which we've been brought up in within the system we have it makes sense yeah why would someone give you free will but then make you as subservient to that person's will it's not free at all and this is where i think we need to before we even address humanity and the bondage of our minds that's been set up with philosophy and psychology we almost have to go back to the first creation that was given some form of will the will of the right. angels and how that manifested into Lucifer's rebellion. So what are people's thoughts on that before we even get to the, the start of humanity's will and how that changed? What's, what's the position on that? I think they were given choice. And I think choice is, is, is diametrically different from free will, right? Their will is not without influence, but they were given the option to choose between two possible outcomes, unable to control the, the, the conclusion. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a funny thing. Um, God told me one time, he was like, you, you actually have the ability to make a choice. I was like, great. Cause I know what I want to choose he goes, what you don't have the ability to control is the outcome. And I was like, I don't like where this is going. I was going <laughs> to make a choice because I, ha I had a conclusion. I had a place I wanted to get to. And he's like, you can't control the outcomes on these. The only thing you can control is what your choice is. And this is so important. We do have choice. Like, like this is the thing. It's funny. Right now, evolutionists and, and other scientists are arguing the idea that we, they're, they're putting forth the idea that we have free will, but at the same time, they're making a counter argument, which is that we don't have such thing as choice. They're saying that our choice is determined by our DNA and by evolution, right? Yeah. So they take away the concept of choice, but they push the concept of free will. It's a, it's a really interesting bait and switch in this dance that they're doing. If we go back, as you were saying, to let's say the first form of creation, which would be the celestial beings, obviously they were given will and they were given the opportunity to choose. But their will, as I was arguing prior to, seems to not be free. One, there's consequence. Well, that's not even one. One, it cost God to give them free will. So it wasn't free of cost. It cost him something to create them and give that to him. Two, it's not free of consequence. There is a consequence. So I don't think they had free will. They had will, but they had choice that they were able to make. And God seems to hold that to all of his creatures. What does he say to us? I give you the choice to stay between, choose between life and death. I hope you choose life. But he doesn't say I give you free will this day. You know, you have choice. This is what we see executed all throughout the created order. And there's a subtle really subtle significance, I think, to why we're given choice. Someone once said that the if you are God, which means you are self-sufficient, you're in relationship, right, within the other members of the Godhead, you don't need anything else at all. So why do you create? Well, you create for a couple of reasons. One, it's part of your nature. And because you are a unified being that is true to yourself, you do what is within your nature, which is create. So you can create all sorts of things. Why create sentient beings? I think the reason, and this is, I, I would rather say, I agree with the reason that the person put forth, which is that the reason God created sentient beings was so that sentient beings could experience the love that he has to give. Mm -hmm. there's no other real way for you to experience the highest degree of love if you're not consciously aware, right? Like, I mean, plants are not experiencing the type of love that we can. They may be somewhat aware, but not like we are. They're not sentient beings. You, that, you put a, you put a good possession though, though, Jason, that if we were, say, completely um, 
Android in our nature and we're just completely fixated on the program. We had no choice and we weren't sentient. We'd be essentially Sims. We'd be NPCs. And the NPCs on the Sims game, when we're building a house and we're making them do things, they have no idea we're there. So they can't experience right. us. They can't experience our love just as in if we didn't, we weren't self, if we weren't conscious and weren't self aware, we wouldn't be aware of, of God's input in our daily lives, let alone his love. So you, you put a good position out. Exactly. Thank you. And I think that's so critical because we get the, the, the gift of experiencing how deeply God really loves us. And even the idea of allowing sin to exist provides God another additional opportunity to show the degree to which he would actually go to save us, how much we really mean. So he does take advantage of these things. However, what's involved in all of that is choice. God chose to create. And then he extends that back. He chose to create in order to express his love. So choice and love are tied. He then allows the sentient being the opportunity to experience that same thing. You get the choice to receive my love. You also get the choice to give it back because choice and love are tied. And I don't think that there's any point where God breaks those, those things, right? You have to choose even to be with him in eternity. It doesn't force you. There's consequence, but you still get the choice. And I think that's so important because one, it completes the cycle. It allows us the opportunity to receive God's love. It also allows us the opportunity to express our love back to him. Two, it doesn't violate who we are as sentient beings, but we also get the opportunity to replicate that throughout the created order by showing love to others. It's interesting to me that as much as the argument for free will and choices is, is, is being posited, it's interesting that in many respects, our enemy seems to have taken the opportunity for us to choose many things while still using this same argument to question God's character. I mean, think of how many things we're subjected to we did not get to choose. And at the same point, he's making the argument, why would a God allow you, you know, to have freedoms to make choices? when you know that there's going to be bad stuff that happens to you. I'm like, dude, you're pretty much why these things are happening because of your choices. <laughs> and they're yeah. taking away opportunities that I would have chose the counter. I would have chose differently. Ah, oh, it's not me. It's that evil God up there who gave you choice in the first place. And, and that's interesting because the whole do as thou will mm. confusion is interesting because, you know, God pushes us, you know, choose this day who you will serve, right? But mm -hmm. Lucifer says, do as thou wilt, knowing full well that because there isn't free will, our will is constantly being manipulated. We put ourselves in a box if we're only doing what we want. Like I oftentimes use the analogy that drug addicts are doing exactly what they want to do, is they're getting high. But outside of what their biology is longing for, like the actual, the soul of that person does not desire to be bound to the will of, of that person's body. So it's really interesting that trying to convince us, even having the focus be on our will, I think misses the step that God has actually given us choice, like like you were saying, Jason. But then going back, Drew, to what you were saying to the um, celestial beings, I think the idea of choice is even nuanced a little bit more because in this conversation, I think we have a tendency to oversimplify choice to, I can choose the good thing or the bad thing, right? But we all know that our lives are way more complicated than that. And even looking at Lucifer, right? He had, he was trading. He had instruments within his body. It was his duty to, um, you know, handle worship and, and praise the most high. And then he's trading all of, all of that requires choice. You know, so it's not just this weird binary thing that we have the ability to, to choose the good thing, or we have the ability to choose the bad thing. Like our entire experience is based off of, choosing you know which other beings to communicate with whether or not to make the trade deal with lucifer you know all of those things it becomes much more complicated so even complaining you know it once we've moved past free will saying you know god shouldn't have given us choice where do you draw that line like are we just robots how much choice are we allowed to have like it's not as is easy to determine i choose to draw the line try to make it 
I choose to draw the line at at your expense. I want to be free to choose to do whatever I want. You can't do a lot of things. I think God should have drawn that line right about when you were going to do something I didn't want you to do. Outside right. of that, I think it should all be good to go. You know how a lot of people look at it, though? Uh, Why would God choose to limit choice? Well, you can look at what somebody else did. How about what you're doing in your own life? Mm. I think he should stay out of that. He should stop meddling to buy affairs, and he should pay attention to the big <laughs> stuff. You know, these are small potatoes over here. He needs to be doing like geopolitics and dealing with all of those type of choices and let me function what I got going on here. I don't think we really would want that existence as much as we we argue for it. I think, mm -hmm. in, in, if I may, <laughs> you really got me thinking on two things. Is one, that's kind of what feminism is. It's like it's inverted. They want the freedom, but they don't want the responsibility or accountability. And what you said to go way back, um, it really started making me think, because this guy came from a show, Babylon 5, but the guy made an, an interesting point. He says, why is it we always focus on the wars with our history? How come we never focus on the errors of peace? We always, you know, mark it. It was this war. It was that war. And I think that's kind of something that I always really hate um, as a historian. <laughs> why are we never told of what was the preludes to the war? What was the things that irked people into getting to this point? What were the treaties that were signed? What was the violations that occurred? And what are we told about in spiritual warfare? They just chucked out the whole book of Enoch, which is the only book that, whether historical canon, I don't want to argue all that. It's the only book that gives an explanation for how angels got under the river Euphrates for Revelation. And if it does have a correlation, at least up to Genesis 6 and Enoch 6, with the sons of God coming down and having affairs with the daughters of men. Now, I've mentioned this before on the show, but I just to in context of this. So if you're God and you understand that your celestial council is going to throw a coup, as it were, and they're going to come down and violate a realm aspect, that, that's not your jurisdiction, just like we don't have a jurisdiction with second realm, third realm. It's not our jurisdiction at this time. We're supposed to be focused right here in the now. Whereas all this other stuff says, oh, astral plane, do this, do that. And that's not our jurisdiction. That's not what we're supposed to do. And so God's like, you know what? I'm going to let them try what they want. Go for it. Go for it. And then he punishes them. He's like, okay, I'm also going to kill your kids, most of them off in the flood. And then I'm going to have Joshua come along and slay the majority of the rest. That's whatever left over. Why? Because the sons of God came down, had affairs with the daughters of men. He does not want abominable offspring. He does not want that because they can't create. They are not create or God, as you stated. But they're trying to invert that and saying, well, if we just merge, mix, we can invert it. We can create whatever definition and creatures that we want. And then they would be loyal to us because they're half us, as opposed to they're just created by a sole singular Force. there's no need to be loyal to because now they're half and half now they get to decide do you want to go with my parents or do you want to go with your parents for the day like well I, no <laughs> i want to stay loyal to the creator there's a reason they're giving us now a choice and i think for me when i read genesis 6 4 sons of god came down and had affairs with the daughters of men and then we get over into first john behold what man of the love of the father that we christians should be called the sons of god I truly believe that if we submit to the word that we end up becoming the new council in heaven, because guess what? I need replacements. They had everything, the best of the best. And instead of that, they chose a fleshly existence. They chose to violate a chance of being part of something greater than anything else of a sentient being could ever have. I am going to give them your robes. I'm going to give them your council positions. And those who prove loyalty to me and chose to stay abiding by the word, those are the ones I'm going to make the new heirs of the kingdom of heaven. So the reason I would state that, John 3.36, he that believeth on the son, which would be the word, had everlasting life. And he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him and john uh first john 2 22 he is antichrist who denies the father and the son if you are not choosing to abide by the son and start to abstain from things of this world then what are you doing you're doing feminism you're doing the microwave philosophies you're trying to find 
what can I substitute? I want to microwave morals. Like, I, I don't need to look into it because some big the philosopher figured that out for me. I'm just going to say, you know, I'm a Buddhist, but you don't really know too much about Buddha. It's just it's what I do. But what do you believe? What is your thinking? Well, I, I, I abandoned that. I just followed whatever this guy said. And that's not what we're supposed to do. I was talking with my buddy and I came up with this little parable. I said, it's a guy that I know. He's watched my shows. I've explained to him Christmas trees. So, so imagine getting up to heaven. And I know I don't believe St. Peter, but I said, just think of this for a second. You get up there. St. Peter says, all right, you're allowed admission into heaven, but you're only allowed to bring one item with you. And the wife says, all right, I'll go first. Raise her hand and says, I would like to bring my Christmas tree with me. St. Peter says, okay, that's fine. He looks at the man and says, what do you, would you like to bring? And he said, I'd like to bring my wife. He says, okay, that's fine, but the tree's got to go. But the tree is what I, I, you know, this is what I've allowed into our lives, but I don't want to eject that because that's part of who she is. Well, you're only allowed one option. So you see what I'm saying? You're making now a choice. And I, I, I went on and I said, so this is kind of what it is with our holidays or filling, uh, you know, God knows my heart. Say you have a relationship. And you've settled into this relationship. But you say, on Christmas, Easter, Halloween, a couple other holidays, I have four or five days where I hang out with my ex, even though we're in a relationship. Would you not feel violated if that is still in your life? And you're saying, I'm just going to go over and sleep with them. for th That is exactly what Hosea is all about. That is what it feels like when they are consistently choosing to go the opposite direction and follow their bales and malachs, as opposed to just abiding in the word and what I have given them. And this is why it's called a relationship, because like you said with the cup, I don't want to take this cup, Dad, because this is a marriage ceremony. I understand what's required with this. And you want to have me die to prove your word? Okay, I'll do that. It's not what I want to do. <laughs> But I understand that the flesh has to die to self in order for them to understand that there's only one thing that can break that spiritual realm anymore. And that's me. That's why I'm the perfect sacrifice, because I showed my genealogy of man and I showed as well that I'm the only immaculate conceived individual that has conquered death and can ascend. And when I come back for my bride, the ones that were loyal to me, that's the ones I'm going to come back for, not the ones that were cheating on me and kept making exceptions and breaking the word of the contract that we had. So I really like where you were going with that, but that was just some things I was thinking about is that if you, if you are choosing loyalty, this is rewarded. If you are still saying I make an exception, are you a cheating sleeping bridesmaid? Think about the intelligence. You know, it's interesting. Sorry, Jason, I just quickly want to add, think of the intelligence that's being used by Lucifer by manipulating one of our greatest gifts was just sentience and choice by being self-aware mm. and flooding the market with choice. The world is full of lots of choices, lots of choices that are going to lead us astray. He may not have created the choices, but he's manipulating the idea that we can fall astray. We can stumble. We can fall. That's what it is to be human. And I liken this to mm. parent with a, a toddler, the toddler if they touch the stove, they're going to burn their hand. And you tell them, don't touch the stove. Ooh, it's very hot. Oh, Bernie's don't touch. But sometimes you actually have to let the kid feel a little bit of heat. You have to let the child fall when you tell them to slow down. You have to let them stumble. So when it comes to the idea that why, why are we given choice if these choices can be bad for us, it's the learning point. That's where we learn. We learn our position, our spot in the world. We learn that, that there are harmful effects of choices, that there are negative outcomes for the choices in which we make. And this is the the ultimate the ultimate irony and intelligence that the the bad guy, the, the this one who wants to take over God's creation and corrupt it, is corrupting one of our greatest gifts as sentience, the ability to make that choice. Oh, he exploits it. This is what I was going to say with, with what Brandon was sharing. It's interesting that while the idea is positive that, you know, you don't have choice or why would God give it to you, that same concept is exploited and weaponized against us because the occult is built off of choice, right? It's a whole legal exchange. If there was no such thing as choice, how does Satan engage in trade contracts, right? How are, how are any of those entities actually engaging in trade and like contractual level that he's been able to exploit and capitalize on if there's no such thing as choice? 
his whole kingdom is predicated on choice. Right? He's actually hoping that people will choose him in the form of worship. It's such a twisted idea to constantly get people to think that you don't have choice and maybe not even free will. If we can ignore the idea of choice and then insert this erroneous idea of free will without the understanding or awareness of the of the person of realizing that their will is being manipulated. What is what then is the point of manipulating the will? It is to get them to make a choice. Choice is one of the highest gifts and principles that we are given as sentient beings. God wants us to choose him through the option of Jesus Christ, who's provided us salvation. And at the same time, the enemy of our soul wants us to choose him and to, in turn, reject God and the offer of salvation. Like this entire war that we are in the middle of is predicated on choice. It's it's a wild concept in to sit around and debate whether or not we even have it. Can I it give you seems a like the type of move, right? It seems like the type of move that you would use if you wanted to put somebody in enslavement. Uh, what are you exactly. talking about? I, I want to throw a piece of scripture at you and then a Frederick Nietzsche quote for the polar opposite, so we can see the light and the dark in this this whole conversation. Galatians okay. five thirteen states. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. I think us gentlemen of the faith understand that and we take that to heart. Yet Frederick mm -hmm. Nietzsche kind of says on this, free will appears unfettered, deliberate. It is boundless, free, wandering the spirit. But fate is a necessity unless we believe the world history in a dream era, the unspeakable sorrows of mankind fantasies, and that we ourselves are but the toys of our fantasies. Fate is boundless, force of op opposition against free will. Free will without fate is just unthinkable as a spirit, without reality, good without evil. One antithesis creates the quality. Well, if we compare and contrast that, that's just very reductionist view of humanity, isn't it? It's putting it back into that idea of do what thou wilt and being the mm -hmm. ultimate controller of your fate and who you are and your position in the world. It's almost man becoming God in that very statement. Right. You know what? There's, there's a whole lot that's going on, though, going on in that statement, which I find fascinating. For instance, first he talks about free will, right? And we, we've already argued that idea. But then he inserts a new idea, which is fate. Mm. What's, what's fate? I mean, I, I've heard it from a Western view a lot of times. You know, hey, that was fate. That was bound to happen. Okay, I get it. From a contextual standpoint, I guess fate is the any the eventual outcome of something that could not be avoided. However, I hit the brakes and go back through history like Brandon was talking about, and I go and I get what happened before the point. Yo, where did fate actually come from as an idea? It's a, it's a Greco-Roman idea. It's a religious idea. You got the three fates. These are spirits. Suddenly, we're not making just a philosophical idea or statement. We are now making a religious statement. Now, free will is being uh, is being put and contrasted against the will of spiritual figures. That's not how he. That's not actually how he explained it, but that's exactly what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Right now, I got all sorts of problems with the the statement from the giddy up. Like, this is not a biblical perspective, yet it's being positioned in contrast to what Galatians was saying, which is that you're free to actually serve righteousness, to do the right thing. Free to, not necessarily free will, but free to. You are free from the, the restrictions that sin places on you so that you're unable to do this thing. And now you are free to pursue righteousness and act accordingly. That is nowhere near what Nietzsche's talking about. I think the Nietzsche's problem with some other stuff. When Nietzsche brings up the idea, and a lot of philosophers do this and um, psychologists, they bring up the idea of fate or destiny. And far too mm -hmm. often that gets conflated with God's timeline. They're, right. they're kind of juxtapositioned into the same thing, the same idea, where they're completely different, different beasts here. They are. There's, there's God's timeline. And then there's some kind of a psychological uh, template that there's manifest destiny. And the things that you do will determine your outcome. Again, very much egocentric driven type of psycho babble that's formulating this idea that we're talking about that's kind of it's already pigeonholed the conversation in such a way that it it controls the outcome it does it's what does it do it cuts god out of the discussion he's completely obliterated out of just the perspective 
and that narrative. And now, as you were saying, it's focused into a godless narrative that now man becomes the center driver of. Your, you make your own decisions. What does scripture say? Scripture says man determines his course, but God directs his actual path, right? There's a relationship between man and God. This obfuscates that and now puts man in the driver's seat, which again makes it not just a humanistic idea, it makes it a Luciferian idea because now God's being replaced with his creation and that's in the driver's seat. Sorry, Brian, I didn't mean to, to, to cut you off. No, that's, that's good. I'm just throwing this out here because ego... We just said choice, destiny, fate. I'm hearing a lot of people, whether it's true or not, but we just had an election in the U.S., did we not? Now let's read the definition for the word vote. To express your choice or opinion, especially by officially writing a mark on a paper or raising your hand and speaking in a meeting, a consent. So, <laughs> essentially, we're saying we're going to make America great again, but we've basically just abandoned the whole concept of prepare ye the way for the Lord. Why are we so focused on the kingdoms of this world, pledging to flags, pledging to something in reverence and awe to venerate, patriotism? Are we kind of in, in we're merging it, we're becoming very just fault as above, so below. We can have God, we're just bringing him down to our level. And eventually I'll sit on his little throne. That's what Baphomet, when you see him doing that little pose, he sits on a little dome, sitting in a throne. I will ascend to be like the God most high. So God and earth, two shall become one. Whereas what is Christ saying? To be reborn in the Holy Spirit, to become the bride, you have to submit to the word. This is how you get access to the Father. I am a representation of my father. I am the word made flesh. You want to understand how to get to the father? You have to submit. You have to sacrifice. Rich man, can you get rid of your coins? Can't? No? Okay. You'll never be the perfect disciple because that was allegedly created by Nimrod's son to Moose. Wait. Things of this world, it has to be put on a weight, a scale. I'm going to be weighing your deeds. Or is your name written in the Lamb's books of life? When you're reading Revelation 19.13, it says his robe is dipped in blood. Why is he sitting on the right side of the throne of God? Because it's part of the you know, triune. But that's my word. That's anything I've ever said. And I have living proof. I created a sentient being to prove to them. I love you this much that I'm sending something into your realm. So that you can come back to mine. As opposed to living in, you know crap that they gave you so i'm kind of wondering now this whole thing with make america great again destiny fate that maybe one man could save it all before things hit the fan as it were are we kind of trying to create our own destiny and fate with this mentality and substituting you know we'll take the shepherd unto mankind like the god made trump video find that very we'll blasphemous it's, it's 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 i don't know i'm just seeing we're we're doing a lot with making people into god men or titans among us and I think we're substituting Christ with whenever he shows it back up, you know, God's chosen people. Here's the thing. That's where I would argue, because when you're reading a lot in Galatians and whatnot, we are the elect. Root word from Greek for elect is chosen. Those who submit to the Father, Son, not in ethnicity, are the new Israel. I would highly argue that. Why? Because it's not about a nationality or ethnicity, as Galatians 3, 28 and 29 and Galatians 3, 7 would state. It's now about those who choose the Father's Son. Otherwise, you are Antichrist. And Antichrist means substitute. Anything that doesn't acknowledge the fulfillment that God's word is everything. Yeah. I would agree. I don't think we're trying to create the, our own fate, I, I think, the, or or destiny, just to make sure that those terms are not conflated. I think that what we are doing is altering the the uh, altering the plan that God actually, or the desire that God had for us, and then coming into agreement with a satanic ideal. 
right? Mm-hmm. So if we were even to say that we were getting to the fates, I, I would have to push back for people who are listening and say the only way then that I could agree that we are altering our quote unquote fate, I wouldn't say we're altering it. I would say that we are determining it because we're coming into agreement with the spiritual forces that the concept of fate represents, right? It's an unholy trinity, the three sisters. And the, the craziest thing is those three sisters all had a single eye. What does that all point to? The same Illuminati, single eye, mm. unfinished eye of the pyramid. What's going back then, speaking not just to paganism, but speaking to the the Canaanite cults, the mystery schools, the, the, the Babylonian magic that actually fuels what is being done here on this planet, which is these... The, the human emissaries that are coming into league with the confederated forces of darkness, that process, I would argue, is fate. And it is what we are constantly putting out in our culture, a culture that is created from a government that is accepted and openly welcomed all pagan gods into its abode. All of this stuff comes full circle and plays with each other. So fate, in a sense, would be equaling. That's yeah. They already have a fate. They understand what that is. Do you choose to choose what where our fate is? Because it's already preordained that you're going to be punished in this great white right throne of judgment. But then we have the choice. Do you want to follow the Father's Son, come back, or you just want to follow the enemy? I don't send people to hell. I just honor your choices. Choices. Right. And also, you were saying in the beginning. It also becomes a sense of obfuscating your own responsibility. And I'm going to use an example from the early Catholic Church. And this existed well up until I think it was the 70s until they removed it, in which a Catholic could pay for their sins to be absolved. You made a payment to the church and it was done. So this happened a lot, ironically, with the Italian mafia. So those were Roman Catholic people. They grew up with the word. They knew thou shalt not kill. But we know criminals. They commit hits, they take people out. So they've killed people in their lifetime. Instead of saying, following God's word, not committing those horrible sins and following God's intended path, they thought they could take the easy route. Go around that, circumvent it, get to the very end and go, here's my $10,000 payment. Those sins are absolved. I got to the end, I'm fine. I'm still on God's timeline. My fate is fine because I got to the end point. They didn't take the personal responsibility of going down the correct path which is set out for us in scripture and, and biblical theology. We know the way we should be living our lives, but we're presented with choices and these choices can often give us route A, route B, route C. Oh, route A might be a bit hard going at times and we know what's the responsibility we have to take for ourselves. Route B looks pretty easy. Oh, route C is even easier. I can do what I want, make all the choices that benefit me as a person and, and benefit the flesh but I'm going to get to the same outcome at the very end because they've given me this out. I, I, that's something we also need to consider is that choices and personal responsibility are often um, overlooked in this conversation. Yeah. I think that's a problem Chris, too. You got anything? Sorry. I just want to make sure we balance it out. I feel like you guys only had one thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, all of this. Hang on. Sorry about that. Suspense. No, um, like all of these different aspects, it keeps coming together. I, I remember, um, I think it was a study that was done on like being able to create a paradise because we've dealt with all of these different aspects of choice and responsibility and what happens if that's taken away and are we just robotic and all of that. And we know that ultimately God is creating a place for us. Right. That's what Jesus said before he ascended, that he goes to create a place for us. And just a, on a side note, if he created everything that we know in six days, but he's been working how many years on, on this new place? I mean, taking away time dilation and all that, what he's preparing for us is far greater than we even have a concept to understand. But um, this study analyzed all the different ways to create a paradise and the issue with everything being just robotic and, and not having free, ch- ha- not having choice and not having consciousness, it eliminates this, this relational aspect that is so important. But once you introduce choice, 
and, and, and an ability to choose the wrong way, then you end up inevitably somewhere along the line, someone is going to screw up. In our case, it was, you know, one of the first two. Um, then it, it puts you outside of this possibility of paradise, which makes this whole setup from the entire creation giving us choice and the genius of Jesus Christ coming in and giving us a bridge from the decadence and decay of our own choices into a paradise that he wants to create like this. It's the only way to make this possible is to first give people a choice and then offer them a way out of the choice to create a paradise. So to all the way, touching all the way back to the beginning, no, I don't think it's a mistake to have that God gave us choice, you know, since we've argued away from free will. I think it's really an aspect to the genius of wanting to create a paradise, because even before humanity came on the scene. Oh, no, he's frozen. Great. <laughs> I you was know, actually Lucifer, looking forward you know, was to it. Turned, I froze up. Yeah, you just yes. froze up <laughs> to the scene, and then you just went, and I was like, "Wow, suspense had me." <laughs> no, even even before humanity, like even with just celestial beings, it wasn't a paradise, right? Because Lucifer was turned violent due to the abundance of his trade, and iniquity was found in his heart, and all of these things. So, how do you create a place if you are God and you are perfect in every way? How do you create a safe place for this? And I think we are experiencing the process. The only way that you can actually create a paradise is by creating choice, creating a saving grace, which is Jesus Christ, which then you can place everyone who got the opportunity to choose in a safe paradise for the rest of eternity. I think it's amazing. You actually touched on something that connects back to what Brandon was talking about, this whole idea of elections and democracies and, and voting your way in or out of something. You mentioned the word utopia. And utopia has been this man-made word as a an inversion of what paradise is. Utopia is supposed to be the paradise on earth that man creates. Man builds it through civilization. Man builds it through voting. Man builds it through having the right leader. But you look at the etymology of utopia in the Greek, it's utopos, which literally means not a place. It can never exist because it's man-made. Mm -hmm. Man cannot create paradise. We can try as much right. as we want to, and we can make horrible choices to try and achieve it, but it's something that ultimately can never exist we are not yeah, created that... for yes right that's crazy that's deep that's deep I, remember, I think a lot of people are going to get some etymology here just alone in this episode because <laughs> i i think that's part of the reason why etymology is so important to our faith and Babel, because the, the the art of double speak the art of getting people riled up by listening to modern soothsayers on tell you know whether it's the narratives all that because we saw this in 2020 especially you're telling me, your friend, I went to high school, I went to college, fill in the blank, your family member, and telling you, I have looked into this, my perspective of this, and you'd rather listen to the person on the television about what to do with your life and what you could possibly inject into said body, as opposed to listening to somebody that genuinely loves you. And I think there's a little bit of a surge spiritually now that people are now saying, Okay, I understand that was political, whatever, medicine, fill it as it were, as it were. Now I'm telling you spiritually, I think there's a lot of things going on. And I'm seeing a lot of lukewarm Christians going, well, <laughs> that might be the case, but I get a rapture so I get out before it gets really bad. I mean, we can go into the whole word of breaking down rapture now. But it's it's like you're taking the cheap way out as opposed to not making anything applicational. So you're not, as a Christian, you are supposed to be an arbiter of the, in the absence of Christ. You are supposed to go forth and make disciples, right? And we all throw mm -hmm. it onto one pastor, as opposed to doing anything ourselves. It's like, well, if you have a question, go ask him, because he's the holy man. So it's like Protestant priests, essentially. There is no self-application. There is no self-sacrifice. And because of this, I think we're getting a little bit of a, similar to the secular society of wanting to fill things with philosophies, we're getting people now that are trying to substitute their responsibilities with a, I'm not going to say fantasy, but like a, a uh, 
it's part of the package plan of salvation that if I accept Christ, I get out before it gets bad, right? Yeah, okay. Just three, three easy installments of sixty five ninety five. Yeah, it's essentially <laughs> that's what it comes. Down, it sounds like. Well, whether it's true or not, I'm not going to argue that semantics. But the thing is, if that's why you're doing it, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And which is better to do the right thing for the wrong reason or the wrong thing for the right reason? I mean, come on, we have to break this down because if you are seriously only take following Christ. Because you think you get out before it gets easy. That comes back to the servant that didn't use his talent. Well, I was mm -hmm. afraid I'd lose it. Everybody else doubled what I gave them and you got scared? I don't want that servant in heaven. This is in Matthew 24. Then talks about the sleeping bridesmaids. It's like all in context. It's boom, 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 boom. And then it's like, guys, we're in Gethsemane. Did you understand anything that I just told you? No. But we, we're now looking at this, what, 2,000 years past. It's like, I'm warning you guys. It's not said to atheists said to those who are thinking they are following Christ or ecclesi, like, you know, they're walking with the spirit, but they really don't understand. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what this is going to require? Do we right. also have to think about the word we've spoken about fate already, but the means in which we understand it and we use it. But I think it's been like through the likes of your yeah, um, psychological greats, greats, air quotes, Nietzsche and Freud and all these people of, really bastardize these words you look at fate alone in its etymology it's a latin word which basically means the word that has been spoken now if i look at that the word that has been spoken or what has been said i tie that back to biblical scripture what are god's word what has god said fate in god's god's timeline is much more important so they've just taken what's what has been spoken the word of god and they've inverted the word fate to meaning something else that, that it actually does Fate literally means that which has been spoken. And I think we need to, you know, take the word back. Don't use it in the context in which the psychobabble has kind of pigeonholed it into being or the likes of Marvel films with multiverses. And this character was always fated to do this. We have to take it back to what it means, the word that which has been spoken. You know, you'd also have to ask the word that has been spoken by whom. Yeah, true. Mm. Yeah. Right, I think it's just as equally important. Like, are you dealing with the word that has been spoken by the word of God, or or are you dealing with you know the word that has been spoken by 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 um, Yahweh, or are you dealing with the word that has been spoken by his enemies, using mm -hmm. the power of spoken word in order to proclaim something over you that by choice you come into alignment with, which then gives legal right to manifest it in your life. Right, yeah. it, it's it's important to make the determining factor. If we're just running around saying, you know, fate, which again, in Western culture and in today's world where we have been systematically detuned and dumbed down, most of us are not going to slow down and think about all of that. Right. We've no, already got a narrative that's been established. But we've got the established narrative through education, right? A system that's been in play for, say, at least 500 years um, since some of the early philosophers all the way through up to psychological scholars and uh, people who nitpick theology and take parts to kind of try and master this spiritual idea and, and bring it into the 21st century. But on top of that, we've got modern day entertainment, which confuses the issue. And gentlemen, right. Christopher and Jason, they are really good at Marvel and looking at how Marvel tries to change our perceptions and what reality is. You know, Marvel's done a, a fantastic job of throwing the multiverse at us and how alternate mm -hmm. realities and string theory can can impact who we are like oh i made this choice but if i didn't make this choice this would have happened and it really tries to muddy the waters of what true understanding is and the consequences of our choices right i'm waiting to meet my doppelganger that did it all right and then i'm gonna take his identity and be like yo this <laughs> this worked out pretty well for me this this is pretty dope but no i think you're you're 100 spot on it's actually one of the things that chris and i were talking about i, I wondered why has there been such an emphasis recently in 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 uh, modern cinema to begin to craft a narrative of this whole multiverse? You know, in this whole idea of of quantum reality, and I found it so fascinating that while Marvel was doing its own idea with the timelines and alternate timelines and doppelgangers and different versions of Earth and all of this other stuff, DC Comics also began to get into the narrative. And I, I remember with the um, Michael Keaton's 
reiteration, not reiteration, but his reclaiming of the role of Batman in the latest Flash movie. Uh, as soon as he's introduced, Bruce Wayne is introduced in that film, um, they have a discussion about timelines. And it was crazy. They presented, DC presents the antithetical version of timelines that Marvel presents. And I'm like, so here you guys are, two competing comic book companies with two competing narratives on the same topic, and both of you have probably got the ears of the majority of people that are watching this stuff. I don't see anybody else really having these conversations about timelines and about, I mean, in a, in a, in a, in a I won't say an absolute sense, because there are people who I know are having these conversations. But in a large sense, I don't see where the church is having these conversations, right? Where the church is educating its members on, yo, this is really how time works. Where are you getting this from? Are you getting this from the influence of Catholicism? Are you getting this from scripture? No, this is a scriptural understanding. This is the biblical view of how time works, all right? And then now we're getting this alternative narrative that is being presented, that is getting popularized, that is now going to start to become part of the standard lexicon, and then eventually conventional wisdom. And I'm over here going, yo, I think the enemy is setting us up for the okie doke, right? Because wouldn't it be interesting if while humanity is getting conditioned for this idea of ultimate realities, so to speak, or, or, or parallel dimensions, or I don't want to say alternative timelines, but more so doppelgangers, right? If you have non-terrestrial beings show up who have the ability to shapeshift, and they're able to shift into you, or you have through Nephilim breeding programs, your DNA being taken, you know, through government controlled, or uh, let's not say government controlled, but through Rothschild controlled interests, you know, where are these companies like BlackRock that own companies like 23andMe, and I'm sure Ancestry.com will come into play. And then they get access to DNA records of people that have submitted DNA samples. What happens when some of that DNA information is then run through Nephilim breeding programs and creates an entity that looks a lot like you that then shows up and you're like, whoa, you look like me. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm you from this alternative timeline. Oh, okay, cool. Well, you know what? Since I've lived half of your life in this alternative timeline, I really think this is what you should do. You know, knew me from 66595. I think that's a great idea. I think I ought to do. So you mean this Jesus thing doesn't really work out? No, we lived it. We went through it. We listen, we really gave it the old scientific experimentation. All right. We didn't just give it the old college try. <laughs> we walked the whole thing out. I'm telling you, this Jesus thing doesn't work. But it what we did do is we also tried another version of who we should submit ourselves to. Uh 6695, would you like to meet 6690? Yes. And who are you? Uh, I'm the version of you that submitted to Lucifer and everything worked out great in our life. Really? We got everything we wanted. Yes. You got 23 virgins. In fact, you got 26 all had fat behinds. It is amazing. There was no limitations <laughs> on fat booties. You had full cakes in this lifetime. Everything was amazing. And I'm telling you, if you just bow the knee, it all works out well for you. Well, you know what? New version of me. I think maybe I should believe this. I mean, it's not working out too well here with tribulation and stuff like this. Not the great tribulation, but at least tribulation. You know, things are going to get rough for us. Jesus told us that. I don't know why people are trying to escape that. He told us it was going to get rough, and it was rough for him. I mean, they did kill him, but that's a whole other thing. I'm seeing it's not working out too well for us here. I'm going to try it your way. We'll go ahead and we'll bow the knee. Imagine six billion people doing that. Well, right? even if it was used to destroy yeah. just religion in itself, let's just say through the likes of a CERN or some kind of communication device, scientific experts in our world say that they've made contact with, say, 366 different parallel universes, all these different versions of Earth. And in every single version of those Earths, Christ and religion does not exist. And they live in a utopia that has exactly. abundance, long lifestyle, free of disease, all this perfection that humanity's trying to try to achieve for thousands of years. It, it exists in these other worlds and religion's been the one thing that's that's holding us back. Not just religion in a general sense. Christianity. Yeah. Well, you know, faith yeah, in Jesus Christ. That one is the, the one that we got to deal away with. All right, we can have every other one. We can get panspermia involved. We can get anything else, but you got to cut out this Jesus freak. It's messing the whole game plan up. 
Matter of fact, it is such a problem. We've got our own version of the guy. We've ironed out all the bad things. We've gotten rid of the stuff that's problematic. You know, you can now sleep with kids. It's it's okay. We're just showing Christ love because love is love. You know, we've gotten rid of all those issues. And now we've got a streamlined version of this thing the way it was meant to be. We had our Chinese brothers help us because they rewrote the Bible, right? They took out all the sticky parts. <laughs> and now we've got this thing streamlined. It is amazing. All you have to do is sign right here on the dotted line. Matter of fact, you don't even have to sign. If you just blink your eyes twice, because we've got you Neuralink connected, <laughs> right? We can, we can tell exactly what you, you meant to do. Right through the metaverse, exactly. So all you got to do metaverse. is blink twice and we're good. No. You know, just execute, exercise your choice. Isn't it crazy? Mm -hmm. All the stuff stacks together. I just said a moment ago, exercise your choice. And it, it made me think about Brandon, what you said, you know, with this whole voting thing. Mm. As much as they're saying exercise your choice, what were we told like for the last, what, six months? Just vote, 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 vote. That's it. That's all we were told while our, while our decisions were being subtly manipulated. Yeah. Right. Don't think about it. Don't mm -hmm. slow down. Don't pray. Just vote. Put your level of agreement right. on whatever aspect of this agenda you think is right. But engage with this. Don't abstain. Don't think. Don't be responsible. And I don't say abstain if you think you need to abstain. It wasn't even an option. Right. We were all right. told engage, execute choice, like do, act, move. That normally is a problem in a high-speed environment in which people are not trained to operate in that environment with discernment and discretion. Right. Seems like choice is a really big thing that a lot of our world runs off of. It's crazy. Yeah. We don't have much of it. And in the political lens of things, we're, we're often presented with choice blue and choice red, Republican, Democrat, liberal, labor, right. whatever you have in your country. A choice between evil and evil light is still evil. And Americans have this fantastic <laughs> ability where they can use non-voting, where they choose not to vote. Or in my situation in Australia where we have mandatory voting, I can choose to go into the polling ballot and draw a penis on it and submit my vote. It doesn't have to be a, a true vote. I can still make a choice. I may have the illusion of choices are taken away from me because the laws in my country say I have to partake in this right. system, but I can still make a choice of putting through a donkey vote, a vote that will no longer be counted. So I still have a choice in that matter. And I think that the situation that Americans found themselves in was an interesting one. And I hate to go down the topic of politics with this conversation, but I looked at the data set and the numbers of people who abstained from voting um, mm -hmm. between the 2020 election and now, just looking at the Republican vote alone, there are 5 million less people who voted for the Republicans this time around. And from what I'm seeing mm -hmm. a lot, this is just my own observations, a lot of it's coming down to theological choices based on faith that they couldn't possibly vote for a, a certain individual, which gives me some kind of hope that people are not only seeing through the scam that is the political discourse, but how the principalities and kings and the lands in which we live are a small factor in the spiritual warfare and people are starting to take notice and make those good choices. Yeah, Where'd you find the information? Awesome. I literally I went onto the, the US Gov website and looked, was a big nerd and looked at the data sets and looked at the graphs and then checked out how much numbers were and weren't there. This is why I like <laughs> talking to you and don't like talking to you. <laughs> Right, because I get great information, but I'm like, you're not even here, and you know to go there. Like, what do you know what I'm doing like here in this country? And I'm like, where did he go to get that information? <laughs> the same place that I could go. That's wild. No, I like that though, man. That, that's really interesting. The... <laughs> go ahead, Christopher. I was I was just gonna make the joke. You only have access to the government website if you're not an American citizen. <laughs> mm. You know, you know what? That's a good point. Either that or you're a fresh immigrant. So, right? now, they so, just let you in. <laughs> you, they'll give you access. Now they might look at this as election tampering via Australians. And that's mm, what happened yeah. with the election, see? Mm. Well, <laughs> well if for no other reason, I think that the Christian Conspiracy Coalition then is going to get a lot of play on CNN. <laughs> right? They're going to be talking about us for Let's a minute. So. Right. <laughs> this will be the one episode they cut. They'll be, they'll be showing the video, but not the audio. It's way too many <laughs> conversations about Jesus on this. No, get him. I don't see it. 
Yeah, it's wild. No, so it's crazy that interesting with the word citizen. Granted, it's not the actual definition, but city means fast or speedily. Zen means to meditate. So as Jason was just implying, though, is like you need to do it. It's like fast thinking. I need to do fast meditation. Whereas if you're meditating on the word of God, sometimes you're fasting. You're really processing. Salah, you're processing what you are going through. And to tie that in with um, scripture, when people are saying, well, how do you know it's a book written by God? Well, it's inspired by holy men of God who are attuned with the spirit. And this is why they felt prompted to write what they did. So that others of us who actually want to walk in the way, the truth and the life, that we actually have some applicational source. Um, and we had somebody like Paul that was saying, I know my Torah, but he didn't understand anything. So God took away his sight. I think that's a big metaphor. You're blindsided, Paul. I'm going to show you how to actually see things clearly. Um, and once I give that back to you, you're going to be one of the most powerful people to write like three quarters of the New Testament even if they were letters, to give context and clarity of what things are supposed to mean moving forward. And I think that's a huge blessing, but we don't really appreciate it. But somebody finally submitted. I mean, that story could have gone somewhere else. But you got to admit, the guy's going, okay, I saw him. Something's here. Something's going on that I didn't see before. Um, and just to close a little bit with what Jason was saying, I was, I was noticing – when he was saying making contracts and timelines and stuff like that in the metaverse, um, something that's interesting that struck out to me is these people are making contracts, with us, whether symbiotic, whatever, demons, devils, fill in blank. We don't really want to know. I don't want to know. But it made me think I of do. a phrase. <laughs> I really do want to know. <laughs> we'll find out when we That's get on the other side. We'll watch it with popcorn. Nah, ORP <laughs> needs to know now because we need to start talking about this stuff. We got to start praying against it. I need to know who's making the contractual obligation that's affecting my life. And, and you know what? I want to know for your sake, Brandon, because I you got bigger things that you're working on. So, you know, I'm going to handle right. the little stuff, right? And I want to know who's doing the contracts because we need to get them out of office. I'll, I'll leave it to you, boys. Um, but it made me think of the phrase that was said in the command, the Ten Commandments movie, uh, with Charleston Heston, um, with Yul Brenner's character. He says, "So let, let it be written, so let it be so done." It be a very done. classic and memorable phrase, uh, said by Pharaoh Yul Brenner's character in that movie. And it was making me think. Like I said, the scripture was written by holy men of God, so God's almost giving His permission and authority. If you are aligned with me, I will allow you to write words that are said by me whether you're a prophet whether you were a judge whether moses fill in blank with whoever <laughs> scribed what but the other aspect is saying the law as it's written here with whatever google things as the meaning is that the phrase indicated the negotiations were over and anyone who did not follow the edict would face consequences if they did not practice pharaoh's announcing of new laws and policies with this phrase and I think that's very potent with what we have going on with our world. Just keep accepting it. Just keep accepting the new restriction. Keep restricting this. Don't worry, you'll get better. In the meantime, nobody is actually going to the word, the source of saying, like, I know it gets better, but we're, I'm looking to eternity, not on things of this world. I'm keeping my mind set on things above, not on, like, because a lot of people are telling me, I think he's the only, the only chance for our country. Like, if all the countries perish in Revelation, why are you being Lot's wife looking one more time at Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> Again, she turned into a pillar of what? Salt. As a reminder for literally 6,000 years later, we're still remembering her because she had to look back at the ways of the world, the cities of this world. And what did Christ say? We're not supposed to be the sugar of this world. We're supposed to be the salt. Because we're preserving mm -hmm. what it is. When you look back, it's bad. So we're giving that story. We're giving it remem remembrance. We are the word. And in Revelation 18, 23, it says, The voice of the groom, which is Christ, and the bridesmaids was heard no longer in thee. Why? Because people don't like the word. They don't like people who are giving context and clarity to the word. They don't like people who are bold, who stand up and speak out for the word. So I think we have that choice to do that. And he doesn't want a lazy servant because I had somebody else write the comment saying, well, yeah, well, God's already in control. So it doesn't really matter who's on the throne. I said, that's absolutely 100% correct. But at the same time, 
what are you doing to wake people up? As Jason just said, some of us need to dig into the little corners and expose that specific thing. Somebody has to explain it to your neighbor, your mom, your dad, your cynical friend. <laughs> Try. Because if you don't, that was your responsibility. You were in that person's circle of influence. That's something you could have just dropped the seed. Whether the seed resonated or not, you were supposed to be the sower. God will determine where, where their heart's at and if it resonates. Just wanted to throw that there. I'm all done. And just on the topic of choice, this is a question I had from one of my listeners, and it was, um, which version of the Bible do you use? And they were oh. looking, they were looking for what to use. And I, I was very upfront with that. This is, I use the King James Bible. It's got a lot to do with. I'm from a Anglo-Celtic country. Um, it's one of the first. It was the first Bible to be printed in English. I'm a bit of a linguistic nerd, and I love the the way and the phraseology it uses. But at the same time, I've got the choice to read a piece of scripture. And then ask, what does that mean? What words have changed in the translation? What is the true meaning of that word? I can go and I can look at other versions, other printings. I can go on to an online biblical source and I can compare the verses and scriptural notes from other Bibles. You don't have to be completely bogged down in a choice of a denomination. You don't have to be bogged down in a choice of a Bible to use. It's not a, mm. a team politics when it comes to religion. We are spoilt for choice in a good way. We are spoilt for choice in a good way because we have the word which has been given to us across many avenues in our modern day. We have different dialects. We have different printings. We have the internet, for heaven's sakes. We've got all these fantastic things at our disposal. And sometimes you can't be bogged down on the right choice to make. And through discernment and prayer, you're going to be guided in, in how to make those right choices. And ultimately, that's God's that's God's path. That's god's timeline that we're on we have good choices that we make and we have an abundance of those just as as lucifer gives us an abundance of choice to try and make us falter yeah because i mean the reality of what what bible to use if you're using an english translation it's not without fault you're just not going to find one and i you like know um no no we have the best translation available because we have the best language available Okay, there's no right, problem with English. That's right. We we no. know the best people that made the best Bible, and it's all in English. <laughs> the Hebrews messed it up. We fixed it, and now it's the best. And we're gonna make the Bible great again. Just so wait. All, I got I'm some more editorial for, marks. I, I'm, oh, I'm oh, waiting. I'm waiting for the Trump oh, Bible. Man. The Trump Bible. This is oh. maybe the best Bible, maybe ever. It's fantastic. I've always read the Bible. This Bible sits next to my bed. I love it, and you're just really gonna enjoy this Bible. <laughs> right. <laughs> Christopher, I think you were like waiting for me to blow up. Look, I, I mean, yeah, we're just make making... the Bible great again. <laughs> that's that's some dangerous language. It uh, is, but I'm like, it's it's right in line with what you keep hearing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that, yeah, that's crazy. And and yeah. not to say that we we do have a choice if we feel that we're drawn to and driven to that we can go out and we can learn Greek ourselves. We can mm -hmm. learn Hebrew, we can learn Aramaic, and we can yeah. look at the oldest versions of Scripture to understand it more fully. Now, in a lot right. of situations, people don't have that time or capacity to do so, which I understand, which makes it more right. important for, um, not to big note ourselves, but voices like ourselves to have these conversations right. and guide people where we can. Are we the arbiters of knowledge of everything theologically and historically? Absolutely not. But we do have some suggestions on areas that we've looked into that we found beneficial, and it's up to people to make that choice whether they go down that path themselves. Right. I, I love right. the way you phrase that because I get that question all the time, Drew. And that's my biggest thing. It says try to apply the basics, but I love the way you phrased it where it's like, listen, you have the the age of information, like it says in the last days, that you literally can go and cross-reference and confirm for yourself what is the truth. It's not like Pilate where you just have the embodiment of truth standing before you and he goes, what is truth? Well, it's like, well, if you dig, you could find out something. <laughs> but you just want to yeah. ask a blank, a blank and statement. And then you put, again, a lot of people are reading it and then they're like, well, it, it's not a Christmas tree in Jeremiah. So let's let's not say that. Let's say it's, um, you know, whatever, you know. Well, And then if you confront somebody, 
they make the exception. I was like, well, I don't do it for those reasons. And God would know my heart if I was doing it like that. And it's like, no, this is where, again, if you're hearing people explain it to you point blank, who bothered like Heidi and I, especially digging heavy into the, the, the nasty stuff of what goes on behind closed doors, or we're reading the occultic books and explaining it to you. It's like, we're reading it. So when you read the Bible, you understand what is hurting God's heart because you want to make mm -hmm. the Bible applicational and alive in your life. That's the choice. That's when we're saying when you're picking up the cross, you fold it up. That's a Kaba cube when you're rolling the dice, which by the way, Christopher and Jason doing Marvel. Did you ever do the, the episode in community where they did the dice episode and they rolled it up and then they had all the probable timelines. That really got me thinking when I found out what the cube means in the occult. I was going, wait a minute. Whoa. Like, where <laughs> we are determining our fate by the roll of a die. And we are gambling, in essence, mm -hmm. how this could possibly go down. As a Christian, when you're picking up your Kaaba cube that represents Earth, what is Christ doing? I am sacrificing the things of this Earth. I die to the old man. I let him stay down here. This is why in Acts, it's constantly asking, were you baptized in repentance by John the Baptist or were you baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, um, baptized by John. See, being baptized in the Holy Spirit means you understand now what it is to be born again. Remember when I was talking to Nicodemus? It has a whole new application. Like I would almost, again, it's not paramount you get into heaven for this, but there's a little bit of a thing where I would say, give it six to eight months, maybe a year. I've seen you get rid of things. I've seen you get rid of your tarot deck. I've seen you get rid of the Ouija board or whatever. You know, you're a walking person along as a disciple, helping them disciple them. And you're saying, I'm seeing you do this. I'm seeing you implement scripture to come alive in your life. And it's not varying on version. It's I'm seeing it in action. That is paramount because we get, you know, what? First Peter 3.15, that they ask of the hope and faith that's within you. I think that's something big that we don't seem to be understanding is that that choice, your life reflects what is with inside you and makes them say it's different from the culture. I want to know more because that's crazy right now to me, but it looks good. Crazy. I think it's interesting that for people like us, we have this ability, but we, we have our own individual shows. We come on here to discuss this. We like going down the historical, the conspiratorial, and the theological rabbit holes to understand more. We, that's what we do. We have this drive to do it. Whereas when we get those questions about um, which part of scripture should I look to for this or what Bible should I be using, I far more often than not, I'm noticing that these are the same people that will prioritize other things. They'll prioritize, say, figuring out why the character did this on Walking Dead and what was the symbolism for something else, which it, <laughs> the irony is not lost on me because I love doing that myself. And Christopher and Jason, you do that mm -hmm. fantastic job with Marvel and the films that you've broken down. But when you prioritize one area that through that choice is taking you away from something else that you could be doing yourself, you're doing yourself a major disservice. And maybe the, the start is asking what Bible should I read? Because that opens up a bigger conversation of, Essentially, it doesn't really matter which Bible you're using. It's your discernment and how you use it and where else you're looking for for the answers. It's not just as a simple answer. Choices don't have all the time a black and white response. There's the whole sea of grey that exists in this physical world and we have to navigate that grey to find the light. I, I think that's one of the reasons that the establishment even pushes back against the idea of what they say is free will, what we're calling choice is because one, if we can choose, then we can choose Jesus. But the other thing is, is that having the ability to choose is such a great responsibility and nobody wants to bear that responsibility, right? Everyone hmm. wants to be in charge. Yes, nobody Parker. wants to have to carry the burden of that. <laughs> so, you know, if it was God's mistake, that he made choice, then it's his fault that I'm choosing badly. You know, if in, you know, even tying it into voting, if I don't have to actually submit my will and give the, the guy down the street, the jacket off of my back, then I can just vote for someone that will do that for me. Like there's so many aspects embedded in our culture that we want to um, relinquish the responsibility and the weight of choice and put it on other people 
Yeah. Relinquish yeah. our responsibility. Exactly. My body, my choice. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Squirrels' lives matter. <laughs> Pretty much. I know it's like the hot button thing you're not supposed to talk about, but <laughs> I, I got a friend who I know uh, advocates for this. And I told her, I was like, you know what? Soon, I want to have a discussion about this. I'm going to argue a point, and I'm going to argue it into the ground with you. And I, I want the argument. I want the fight. Because I, I want to understand the, the, other pers- the other perspective and the other side, but I'm also not going to, to pull any punches. But one of the things I was saying to her just in a, in a preliminary was, I, the only person I know who advocates for abortion is the one who wasn't aborted. I haven't found one who was that advocates for it. I, I And it's interesting that the argument that is predicated now for the, for the most part is really my body, my choice. The other person that's affected by it, that argument doesn't hold up. Their choice is taken away from it, yeah. which is so crazy within the concept of you can't impede my ability to choose. Right. I'm like, there are a lot of laws that do that. A lot. Right. There are a lot of dudes right now that wouldn't make it through puberty the way they did if the certain laws weren't in place that impede their decision making. Right. If my body, my choice didn't hold yeah. up through puberty, there's a lot of things I'd have chose to do differently. But, you know, thank thank God for, <laughs> for Christ and renewing the mind. Yeah. Right. It, it's crazy. It's crazy how um, convoluted and segmented the public thought, the public mind is on this topic, right? We're arguing, mm-hmm. do we have free will? We're arguing, do we have choice? We're arguing, I mean, is there really such a thing as choice? Is it not just something that's part of your DNA? Is it not something that's evolved over time? And at the same time that that's being put forth, we have political arguments to say, well, it's my body, my choice. So apparently you do have choice. And at the same time that that's being put forth, we have a multi-billion dollar advertising industry that manipulates choice to profit off Mm -hmm. of it. It must be a real thing. And like you said, Christopher, it's a huge responsibility that you're right. Most of us don't want the the responsibility to choose correctly. Right. Like that's life in a nutshell. Like that's all the training we do. Me. Right? That's everything that we're teaching our kids. How do you choose? How do you, you choose between right and wrong? Mm. How do you make this, you know, how do you understand how the game is set up against you and then make a, a wise and insightful decision? All of this is predicated on choice. I don't even know what type of world we would have if we didn't have it. Yet people are arguing, well, why did God give it to us? For the sake of the existence that we get to enjoy. Because without choice, mm-hmm. I think that this would be a mundane existence. We lack the variety of life that really helps to give life spice. Mm-hmm. Right? Everything would just be mundane. And that's not the God we serve. A creative God would give creativity and allow for creativity even, even within the realm of decision making. We get to be creative. We get to even choose creatively. It's so fundamentally important to us as as sentient beings that, and as we were created to reflect our maker, to be given that option for choice and to execute it, steward it properly, but execute it responsibly. Well, and I, That's and what I think it really means to be human. And speaking on creativity, you just inspired me through that, that, that whole conversation that I need to make a shirt now that's literally going to be a Venn diagram of a will, choice, responsibility, God's timeline, dead center. Those three things I like all culminate yeah. together. Your will to follow the right path, your choices that get you there, and the responsibility to make sure you're doing the right thing. They all coalesce into this one thing. It's not free will. You have a will to make those choices. Those choices are either right or wrong and you have the responsibility to make sure you're doing what's right for you and those around you. That's dope. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And not project the finger of the endemic excuse. It was the woman. It was the serpent. It was the, no. Because he constantly says, did you eat from the tree? Did you? He gives them several chances. Come clean with me. What went down? It was them. It was them. It was them. It was, them. It was the government. It was this. It was that. Well, I. it was hard to choose. Lesser two evils. It's like, no. <laughs> Talking about individual, not the institution, not the ideologies. We're talking about you. 
talking about you specifically. Because again, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. That's personal. It's per individual. And you are accountable mm -hmm. for that. It's the idea right. of blaming. It's like you like you said, Christopher, the outsourcing of responsibility that you know you have to take away some form of control to make it easier on yourself. Can you just imagine Lot's wife? It was just a little look. It was just a little peek. It was just a small one. That's all. It wasn't so much of a thing. It was a small peek. I just had to see it. I heard an I explosion. To... It was a like reaction. There was an explosion was in the screen, and reaction. I just happened to look. Right. You can't blame me for that. It was technically on my peripheral, so it was kind of out. <laughs> I tripped. It wasn't even in focus. <laughs> right. Right? That's That's funny. <sighs> Well, gentlemen, I think we've covered this as far as we possibly can. We've we've yeah, really deep, pulled man. we've pulled apart the idea of does free will truly exist? We've kind of moved away from that. That the idea was pigeonholed by some of our greatest philosophers and our mental gymnastics of science. We've pinpointed that really it's a choice and the responsibility of self in making those right choices. So. This has been a great conversation. Uh, you guys came back after a bit of a hiatus. You hit it hard. You you brought the fire on this one, guys. I'm so glad you, you're back. Brandon, you've got a lot going on at the moment. Um, how can the listeners find your work? Yeah, Mena Daily Podcast, Spotify, Rumble, YouTube, Patreon, and uh, Crollology, like the name on the screen, K-R-O-L-L, ology, lower underscore 101 for Instagram. And thanks for having me on. This was fun. And by the way, I just had to say this. I felt like I was playing a game of Guess Who tonight. Does your character wearing glasses? No. Does he have red hair? <laughs> wearing a hat. I'm sorry. I was looking at the screen when you guys all came on. I was like, this is fun. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I have to say for the night. So I'm Christopher oh, from fun. Earth 06521. And in this universe, <laughs> my ancestors went to Australia instead of America. It changed a lot. That's You're funny. no longer seven foot eight. Yeah, it, like... there wasn't much food in Australia. That's why we were stunted down here. I love it. Oh, that's great. Gentlemen, you're back. This is, like I said, a fantastic conversation. Really enjoy ha having you on the panel. Where can the listeners find your work? You've been releasing a lot of content, some fantastic stuff of late. So please direct the listeners to where they can find your work. Uh, our home site is orppodcast.com. You can find us on social media. ORP podcast on Instagram and Facebook. You can find our Patreon at patreon.com slash ORP podcast. And not even everything on our Patreon is behind a paywall. We have some crash course series that are, you know, within 30 minutes, if you don't have a lot of time that highlight some things. And we try to put some other bonus content up there, just uh, trying to get as much content out as possible. So yeah, uh, reach out to us. You can uh, send us an email at let's talk at ORP podcast. We're very reachable. Uh, we try to get back to people as soon as possible and we love to hear from you. Fantastic. And if you're listening to me on either of these gentlemen's platforms, I'm Drew Missing of You're Missing the Point podcast. If I'm in all the usual podcatchers. Uh, yeah, if you want an Australian perspective on things, I'm here. I'm very vocal, probably vocal too much at times, but you know, <laughs> I, I'm here to be a thorn in the side of people and... <laughs> You know, Ecclesia is not just a gathering of people to call them out for the word. It's to call people out for their wrongdoing. And I've been doing that a lot lately down here. So forgive me if I'm ruffling a few feathers. Uh, Jason, could you please close the show of the prayer, please? Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the gentlemen that have gathered here. And for those who are listening uh, abroad, we ask, Lord, that you will protect us. Thank you for helping us walk through this time that we've been granted within the timeline to affect and carry out your will. Give us the courage to do that in the face of evil and adversity and protect those as they pursue your calling, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless, and we'll catch you next time. See you, See you man. <laughs>